GraphQL is a pretty great technology you can use to build your API. First of all, you can define a strongly typed schema describing what resources are available and what parameters your request can accept. And when you consume the API, you can define exactly what data you need, nothing more, nothing less, and you can get that data with a single request. What's even better is that you always use the same endpoint. So regardless of how many services you're trying to access or what types of resources you need, you're always using the same endpoint. Now, building a sophisticated GraphQL API can take some time. What if I told you it takes a minute to build a secure, hosted, and serverless API using the MongoDB Atlas app services? Let's see how. First, you need to open the Atlas user interface. As you can see here, I have my database deployments, including the Rocket Launches database and the database for my e-commerce store. Next, I have to go to the App Services tab. Then I have to create a new application, give it a meaningful name, and connect it to my data source. Additionally, I can choose the region and the cloud provider that I want to use. When my app is created, I need to set up the data access rules. As you can see, I have three collections in here. And for all of them, I'm going to use one of the preset rows, which is the read and write all. You can add a lot more sophisticated rows depending on who is accessing the data, but for our demo, this will do. Then I have to generate the schema. As I mentioned, GraphQL is a strongly typed interface for our API. Luckily, I can generate the schema from the existing documents in my collection. I'm going to do the same for all my collections. And I can even add relationships between the collections. So for example, here I can add a relationship between the customer ID in the cards collection to the customer's collection and the ID field there. Finally, I'm going to review and deploy this draft. And when the deployment is completed, I can navigate to the GraphQL tab over here and try out my newly generated API. I'm going to query or rockets and select the name. I can also limit the results. And that's it. I have my secure, serverless, and hosted API in just a minute. But even when you're using a technology as great as GraphQL, you can face certain challenges. Let's say that we are building an e-commerce for rockets. And we have divided our application into multiple services, depending on the functionality they implement. For example, walk-in, cart, products, checkout, and so on. We have different teams working on these services, which is pretty great because we have split the responsibility and every team is responsible for only one service. The problem is that if we are using a single monolithic GraphQL server, all teams have to contribute to the same schema. This will slow down their productivity and our releases will quickly become a nightmare. The problem is that even if we're using a microservices architecture or another distributed architecture, if we have a monolithic GraphQL server, this will quickly become the bottleneck in our process. But let's take a look at another even more practical example we can face in our day-to-day -day work. This is my e-commerce for rockets and here we can see a list of all the rockets that we sell. I can navigate to the product page for Vega and here I see the details for the rocket that are stored in my e-commerce database. However, on this page I also want to display the information about the launches of this rocket. The problem is that the launches reside in another database that is not the same as my e-commerce database. So I can do one of two things here. I can either send two separate requests to gather all the data that I need to display on the page or I can build my own API gateway. The problem with building an API gateway is that it's not a trivial task to, uh, to accomplish and it's not a trivial code base to maintain. So how do we fix these problems? The first one is uh, having a monolithic GraphQL server in our architecture. And the second one is combining data from distinct sources. Luckily, today with us, we have JC Lovelace from Apollo, who is going to tell us how we can solve these problems with a great new technology that Apollo has been building. All right. Thanks, Mira. So my name is Jesse Lovelace, and I'm a solutions engineer with Apollo GraphQL. Today, we're going to be talking about how the Apollo SuperGraph can allow your applications to actually span multiple different services or database backends. And to 
introduce this concept, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the problem that Apollo Federation tries to solve. Okay, so the problem that we're trying to solve is this issue of the complexity bottleneck that's introduced whenever you have lots of different API endpoints. So on the right-hand side of this diagram, we have lots of different services that are probably exposed via REST or some sort of technology like that. And they're all point-to-point -point services in the sense that whenever one of the applications on the left-hand side needs to make a request, it has to go out to that particular service at a particular REST route, get back some information, and then it probably has to actually talk to a couple of different services and to do, to do everything that it needs to do. With the advent of microservices, we've kind of split out these domain models into multiple different service backends. And that requires our front end applications to actually be pretty smart because they have to be able to know the order in which to retrieve data. So they might go first to a login service and then they might go to a product service and then they might go to a cart service or a review service or something in order to pull together all the different information they need on the client side, join it together on the client side, and then have their screens or their UX actually be populated the way they want. Now, the problem with that is that there's a lot of different endpoints that you have to know about. There's a lot of you have to know about in terms of the order in which to pull data together. And many times, especially in larger organizations, this actually becomes really difficult because then you also have different representations of objects in the sense that you might have two different resources within all these different REST APIs that maybe define a product result. So you might have, you know, slash API slash v1 slash product um, on multiple different places and those product uh, objects might actually not be consistent and so you've got to have a lot of special case logic that you have to build up within your client apps in order to be able to handle all these kind of strange use cases and this causes at scale a lot of time to be wasted with all this integration work instead of actually building the products and so what we tried to do within the industry in order to solve some of this is to introduce things like API gateways, which gave you like a single host name that you could talk through. But API gateways actually only address kind of some of the symptoms of the problem. They don't actually address the underlying problem because even with an API gateway, you still got routes that are going through from your front end apps to your back end services in kind of a one to one mapping. Um, they might alleviate some problems around, you know, um, edge authentication and, you know, some um, observability and things like that. They don't actually solve the complexity problem. And so what another thing that we did as an industry is we actually started creating things called BFFs or backends for frontends. And these are actually a little bit closer to solving the problem, but they actually introduce other problems um, whenever they were actually implemented. So a BFF acts like kind of a custom API for a front end. And that custom API is going to basically present to a particular front end application, let's say an iOS app, a really nice, concise API. Um, and that backend for front end is actually going to hide a huge amount of the complexity of the services that are behind it. And it's going to try and do um, data aggregation and joins and stuff like that in order to keep that all that mess from your front end app so you can have less code in front end apps. Well, the problem is, is that now we have an entirely new API that we have to maintain on top of these backend APIs. And a lot of times backend for front ends are written specifically for the front end apps. And so you're going to start to have multiple different backends for front ends. You're going to have teams that have to keep these backends for front ends up to date. And they also have to keep them in, you know, synchronized with the backend services. So whenever you change a backend service, you've got to update the BFF. Don't, if there's not a, like a really nice, tight release coordination between those teams, then the front end developers might be waiting on the BFF to be updated until they decide they have to actually reach around it maybe and talk to the actually underlying APIs. And so long term, with the customers that we've talked to at Apollo, they've realized that BFFs just have a certain lifespan. They're great at first, but they start to become a drag on the overall productivity of the organization. So let's say that we had a magic wand and we could create kind of the ideal API for your front end applications to talk to. And um, what I think the front end, the ideal state 
of an API would look like is that we have one unified data representation in one endpoint that we can query data from. And so with this kind of single source of truth, your front end application could just query the data layer and it could get back the data in whatever shape that it wants it to. And this data layer actually would bring about a decoupling between the front end applications and the back end services. So that if I ask for a particular piece of data, um, it, I don't really care how the back end service is implementing that. The back end services have to, you know, be modified or like scale out or they have to split one service into multiple services or even maybe recombine services into a larger one because maybe they did they were too aggressive with their microservice strategy. I don't really want to know about that as a front end developer. I want a consistent data API that I can query data from. And I want to be able to discover that. I want that consistent source of truth to actually outlive any of the implementation details of the backend services. And one of the other things I want is I actually want to be able to reduce the amount of round trips that I'm making as a front end developer. I want to be able to pull the data back in one query, ideally, and I want to have that data already pre joined. And what I mean by that is I want related data to actually be pulled together and returned back to me so I don't have to go piece together that related data. Like in the example we talked about a little earlier, where we have you know, a user and then I have to go get the products that the user has purchased, and maybe then I have to go to the rev reviews API and pull that stuff in, and maybe I have to also hit like a inventory API or whatever. I want to actually be able to pull back my user with all of its related products and all of the related reviews and all the related inventory information in one API query. And this is kind of the holy grail of um, front end API engineering. Because once we can do this, we can make our front end applications actually much less complex. And so Apollo actually has done this with its federation technology and with the concept that we call supergraph. And the supergraph is basically a graph of graphs. What I mean by that is that it's a single unified endpoint that has all of the different GraphQL schema data merged together into something called supergraph. And it's not just a, a blind merging of lots of different data, like using a concatenation. It actually is a very intelligent merging, wherein we know how data is related to each other. And so therefore we can do automatic API side joins whenever we ask for data that's related to each other. And we'll get to this a little bit more when we come to the live coding demo. But what that means, practically speaking, is that as a front end developer, I can ask for user properties, let's say like user.id, user.last login, but I can also, using the Apollo Federation technology on the supergraph, tell the supergraph how user is related to products. So therefore, then I can ask for, let's say, user.products. When I ask for that, the supergraph, which is powered by the Apollo Graph Router, is actually going to know where to find that data in the backend services, pull it all together, and return it to me as one result set, um, which is kind of my ideal state. So what I'm going to do now is actually jump into my code editor, and we'll kind of start building out a super graph so that you can see how everything's put together. Okay, so just to start us out, we have got a e-commerce application, and this e-commerce application is very similar to what or e-commerce backend uh, application. This is similar to what uh, Stan Miro showed us a little bit ago. And so within this application, we've got a couple of kind of common pieces that you'll see in a lot of different Apollo subgraphs if you're implementing a GraphQL subgraph. So probably the most important piece of this whole thing is the schema. And so the schema is actually our representation of all the types and queries and mutations on this particular subgraph. And in our case, um, these types are things that we see in our MongoDB database. So for instance, we've got a rocket, We've got a customer, we've got a cart. Now, all of these things are actually 
something that we can see within our collections over here. So if we go over to our MongoDB database and our e-commerce database here, we can look at these collections and we can see things like, you know, rockets. So in this database, we've got these rocket objects and they've got a lot of information about you know, various different rockets that we're offering in our rocket store. These are the products in our application, right? Yeah, so these are the products that we're selling to our store. And so whenever we, you know, kind of started to build out the schema for this, we just did a very simple kind of mapping of the fields within these MongoDB objects, and we mapped those to a schema here that is GraphQL compatible. Now, some of the things that you might notice that are a little bit unique to an Apollo federated GraphQL schema are things like this little preamble here, where we um, have this extend schema and this link directive. And then we also have these things, um, which are the key fields on these types. Now, the reason that Federation asks you to define these is that this helped the Apollo router and the SuperGraph composition system understand how to actually look up various different objects on your graph. So what this is basically telling us is that this rocket type here can be looked up by the ID field, and it can also be looked up by the name field. And basically what that means is that those are kind of like unique indexes for those particular objects. So JC, just to ask you, do these keys over here uh match exactly the indexes that we might have in our Atlas collection? They can. So they don't necessarily have to, but you're going to definitely want them to be uh, fields that you can actually do some sort of efficient, you know, find query on. So for instance, the ID field here, um, in my schema, I'm actually not using the, the normal MongoDB underscore ID. Um, I'm mapping that to ID just because um, to make it kind of more of a natural API um, that doesn't have any database specific you know, um, feel to it. But underneath the hood, it actually is using underscore ID. So you know for sure that you can look up on that. And that's going to be pretty consistent with any MongoDB collection, the ability to look up on that underscore ID. And then the, the other keys that you might define for that are probably going to be indexed fields um, and possibly you know, uniquely indexed fields and so in order to make sure that we're getting um, the exact object out of the database that we're looking for. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so we can actually go ahead and test this particular subgraph really quickly just to make sure that everything's working the way that we expect. Um, and to do that, we just need to launch the Apollo server. Now, the Apollo server is initialized through the server.js file. Um, I won't go through all of that right now, just because we actually will be building our own subgraph in just a second. But um, we can actually go ahead and just run this really quickly to make sure that we can query a MongoDB database uh, the way that we expect we can. So I'm just going to go into the um, e-commerce subgraph. I've got this, you know, basically in a mono repo for this particular coding exercise, but you know, as these kind of projects grow, you'll probably have these in separate repositories. Let's go ahead and just launch uh, our Node.js server to make sure that everything's running the way that we expect. Okay, so whenever we start up an Apollo server, we're going to have the opportunity to go and talk to it um, at its local address. So let's go ahead and open that up, and we will put that in here. And whenever we open up an Apollo subgraph at its local address, we're going to be able to use something called the Sandbox. And this is a feature provided by Apollo that basically just gives you a really nice interface to talk to your applications as you're developing them. Okay, so within this Sandbox, we have the ability to write GraphQL queries, um, to pass them variables, and to see what the responses look like. So in this particular one, um, let's go ahead and just do a very simple call to the get rockets query that I've defined on our subgraph. And that get rockets is just basically going to get a list of rockets from the database. 
And we can go in through the Apollo Sandbox here and pick all the different fields that we want to add to our GraphQL query that we're building up. So we can do the ID, we can do the name. Um, let's do um, price as well. And we'll go ahead and query. And so we're querying our local Apollo subgraph using Apollo server. And that's reaching out to our MongoDB collection and pulling in the data that we're looking for. So this is the response that we're getting from that particular endpoint. Now, as Mira talked about a little bit earlier, we'd actually like to be able to pull in data from our other MongoDB database as well and expose that as a separate subgraph, but then also allow the API to merge the data together between those two different um, databases on the fly. And so in order to do that, we'll actually build up a new subgraph from scratch um, and kind of see how all that's put together. Before we jump into that, is there some sort of a number of um, subgraphs that we can add or any limitation of the type of type of sources that we can use for, for these subgraphs? So a subgraph needs to be able to speak GraphQL. And so if it talks GraphQL according to the specification, you can actually add it as a subgraph. Now, if you want it to have kind of more advanced capabilities, like the ability to do that data modeling between subgraphs and uh, type extensions, then it also needs to support the Apollo Federation protocol, which is basically just a set of uh, various different keywords and directives that are added at the schema level that our service, the Apollo Gateway and the Apollo Router, actually understand and know how to use that information to pull together data and to know where data lives and how that is related to each other. So there's a bunch of different subgraph libraries out there that support Apollo Federation. And we have an entire page devoted to all the different compatibilities. Uh, we've got subgraph libraries for Golang um, that are open source projects that we don't write. We have Python compatibility um, and .NET, lots of different languages out there that you can use to implement a subgraph but they do need to be able to at least speak GraphQL in order for us to add them into a federated architecture. Um, and there's not really a practical limit. Um, you're, you know, you're probably going to um, not have thousands of subgraphs, but you could easily have dozens or hundreds. Okay, so let's actually get started um, building up our application. So like I said, we have our e-commerce application. It's already running. Um, we know that it basically works. And so now we want to do two different things. One of those is we actually want to um, get a gateway that we can utilize to kind of be that intelligent routing layer between the front-end applications and the subgraphs. And then we also want to start building our actual subgraph. So let's go ahead and create a little project for the gateway. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to use Apollo's Node.js gateway technology. We actually have another gateway technology that's called Apollo Router, uh, which is written in Rust. And it's kind of the next generation high performance um, gateway technology. But since we're doing all these subgraphs currently in JavaScript today, we'll just kind of use the, um, the traditional gateway technology. So let's go ahead and create kind of a skeleton project for that. Wait, how do you use the skeleton command? Is this some NPM package that you have installed? Um, so the skeleton command is just a little um, application that I wrote that allows me to um, basically quickly set up template projects for um, GraphQL applications. Um, it's, it's not open source, um, but it's something that I can definitely share with people if they're interested in using it. I'm, I'm sure they will be. <laughs> Okay, so we've got our gateway. It's in the right place now. Um, the gateway project is very, very simple. Um, it really only has one JavaScript file in it, which is the server.js. Um, if you look at it, initializing the Apollo gateway is super, super simple. Um, it's only a few lines to get up and running. And the reason that it's so simple is that it's actually utilizing Apollo Studio to pull down 
the super graph information. So what Apollo Studio is, is it's our hosted GraphQL control plane, which has also our Apollo super graph registry. And so the registry is where we store all of our super graph information. Super graphs have a ton of information on them that allows the gateway to actually run without really any other configuration because the super graph has stuff on it that allows the gateway to know service discovery, so where the different services are located, and it actually also has all the kind of data discovery information. So what service owns what fields and what types and what queries and all that kind of stuff, which allows the server configuration to be really, really simple. So you can see here that we're just importing the Apollo Gateway package. The Apollo Server package is kind of the base for the gateway technology. Um, I'm importing .m so I can quickly kind of get some environmental stuff up and running. Uh, we construct an Apollo gateway, and then we construct an Apollo server, passing it in the gateway information, and then we just start listening on the port. So super simple. There's not really a lot going on here. The big thing that we need in order to make all this work is the environmental variables, which are our Apollo API key and the kind of graph ID that we'll also need to tell the registry which super graph to pull down whenever it initializes the gateway. Basically, you don't need any local configuration uh, in your gateway application. Everything is in the registry, and uh, the Apollo Studio does all the connecting uh, for you, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, you can, uh, the gateway actually has a ton of different hooks where you can extend it if you wanted to. So, for instance, if you wanted to do some advanced authentication, you could do that at the gateway level. Um, if you want to kind of export information to different services or maybe reach out to a third party service to do kind of some sort of um, authentication request or something like that, you could all do that if you wanted to at the gateway level by just writing some very simple functions that plug into this um, JavaScript library. Something like a middleware for, yeah, for exactly. Node.js. Mm -hmm. And this actually supports um, you know, kind of common middleware technology. So for instance, you could write express middleware that would work for this, um, this server as well. Okay, so we've got the gateway up and we're ready to go. Um, the next thing we need to do is actually build our new subgraph. So in order to do that, I'm gonna kind of create for us a, a skeleton subgraph project and we'll call this one launches. Um, and this will match what we're doing in the, uh, the collection on the MongoDB side. So in the launches, I'm actually just gonna use um, a little skeleton command to just kind of create a bare bones subgraph. And we can see what's going on in there. Now the subgraph has a little bit more in it than the gateway because it's in the subgraph that you code things like your resolvers each subgraph has its own GraphQL schema. And then you'll also kind of be interfacing with your specific data sources. So today we're going to be interfacing with MongoDB, but it could be that you interface, let's say, with a, a downstream REST service or maybe even a gRPC service. You could be um, interfacing with other types of database technologies, like even graph databases um, or kind of anything that you want to. The, Subgraph technology is purposely extremely flexible so that it doesn't really matter where you're pulling data from. Um, the subgraph is really concerned about making sure that um, you have a schema and that you have resolvers that can fulfill all of those different queries and mutations that you find on your schema. So first things first, let's actually write our schema because that's kind of the heart of this project for the launches. Um, I've got kind of just a simple stubs in here in order for us to kind of get started. Um, within a GraphQL schema, you have basically, um, you know, two important concepts. One are the actual types that you're going to be returning. And then you've also got um, your root query type that's going to have actually all of your different queries defined on it. And then if you have mutations on this, you'll also have um, a mutation type that you can put all your different mutation functions into as well. So to get started, let's take a look at our collection within the MongoDB Atlas. 
And from there, we can kind of start deciding what we want our schema to look like. So let's actually head over there and here we go. So let's load up our other database, which is Rock Launches here. Let's look at the collection really quickly and see what's going on here. So the collection that we have in here is called Launches. And then the objects in here are we have ID, we have a date that the launch happened, we have a payload, a vehicle name, we have a site, I guess this, this is the location of that launch, and then the year that happened and maybe any kind of notes. So this is a pretty simple um, object here. So it's gonna be pretty easy for us to actually um, write this using GraphQL schema. Now, I'm already thinking about when I'm looking at this, how we're gonna relate this data to the data in our other database. And so it looks like to me that the way they're gonna relate that is actually through this vehicle, which is going to be kind of the key that we'll use to join together the information from our e-commerce rockets database and this launches database that we have on the side. So, we know that we have ID, date, payload, vehicle, site, remark. All right, so let's go over into our code editor and actually start modeling out this launch object. Okay, so we've got an object that we want to define and that's called launch. Now, like we were talking about earlier, since this is a MongoDB database, we've already kind of got a, a primary key. So let's go ahead and announce that so that we can look up our launch by ID. So we decided that um, ID here is a type ID, which is a special type within GraphQL that is basically used for database IDs. And then we also have some other fields that we want to fill in here. So we've got a date field, um, this is represented in the database as a string. We could actually make a custom um, date object for this. And, you know, whenever we load this up, have it be parsed into that object. But for now, let's just go ahead and kind of do a straight walkthrough of the various different fields that we've got. Payload. We've got vehicle. Site. Mark. And then year, which looks like it's going to be an integer. Okay, so now we've got um, the launch object in here. Let's actually create a query so we can actually start pulling data from the MongoDB collection based on this launch. So let's call our first query that we're going to write get launches, and we'll make it return for us a array of launch objects. Now in GraphQL, we can also annotate things to say that they're non-nullable. Um, so for instance, we could say that this overall result is non-nullable by using that exclamation point uh, decorator, or we could also um, say that all of the objects within the list can be non-nullable or not. Um, but we'll just kind of keep this um, the way it is for now. So in order to start going here, after we've created our first schema, the next thing we probably want to do is start writing our database interface to this particular collection. So the way that I've got this organized in my project is I've got my server initialization code here in the server JS file. I've got the glue that maps my um, query names to the specific functions that we're gonna write at our database data source access level. And then I've also got a little folder for our data source code. And this is actually the code that we're going to write that's going to talk directly to the MongoDB database. So let's go ahead and start writing this code and um, see if we can't go ahead and start making queries. So I've got a sample little data source in here. A data source is just a class that you can use with GraphQL projects that allows you to put um, a lot of your database access code in one place and it allows you to have kind of like a common initialization. Um, and you can also do uh, some more advanced use cases with data sources as well. So let's get started. 
And I've called this my API, but we should actually probably make this more specific and call this our launch API. And then our collection here is actually named launches. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, make a very helpful little variable that I've attached to this um, that we'll call actually, um, let's just call it launches. Now, whenever I access this dot launches, I'll actually have access to the collection. So the next thing we want to do is actually want to start writing some queries. I've got some helper functions in here um, that, um, for instance, this allows us to basically attach a context object. If we were doing, you know, authentication authorization in this particular coding example, then we'd actually use that context object to pull out things like um, the user authentication authentication context, maybe like a JWT object, stuff like that, in order to do some uh, role-based authentication. We're not going to do that in this coding example, just because this is um, a little bit more of a, a beginner exercise, but we could do that if we wanted to. I've also got a little function in here to actually uh, map the MongoDB underscore IDs just to a normal dot ID. Um, again, this is just to make the API very kind of non-database, um, not leak in database information from the actual schema. So if we replace MongoDB with another data source, um, it's still going to work because we don't have like MongoDB specific types in the result, right? Right, exactly. Okay, and then I've got some sample functions for us to actually do some stuff. So do some query. The first query that we're actually interested in is getting a list of launches. And so we can write that really quickly. We can just say get launches is our query name. Um, it'll just be a an open query on that collection, so we won't actually have any kind of filters attached to it, so we can remove this stuff. Um, we can limit our result size to 50, no problem. We won't worry about any sorting uh, this time around. Um, and we'll make sure that we're referencing our actual collections object in here, so punches. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll just, you know, get back the results as an array, and then we'll use our little um, mapping function that I talked about just a second ago to pull off those underscore IDs and replace them. And then we'll just return that back. So pretty simple. We've written our first um, data source function here. It's talking to a MongoDB database. And then we'll just do a little bit of um, gluing things together really quickly so that we can test this out. The first thing we need to do is actually make sure we're exporting the right name. So we call this launch API. So we're pretty much good to go with this file. Let's rename this data sources file. So it's not sample.js anymore. We can actually call it launches. And then we're going to go through and we're going to make sure that everything's referenced correctly within the JavaScript code so that when the server initializes, it's importing the right files and objects and modules, and it's going to be ready to go. So what we can do now is we can actually go into server.js and we can make sure that everything's lined up in terms of what we're calling things and we're initializing the Apollo subgraph correctly. So first things first, let me walk through this file and show you what's happening so that everyone has a good feel for a subgraph initialization. This is a very straightforward um, that we're not doing anything fancy or any kind of advanced um, ways of breaking this up into multiple files or anything. We're just kind of doing a very linear import and initialization. So at the top here, you see that we're importing some modules that we might need in order to read stuff from the disk. We're importing .env again, just for a helper function. And then we're actually importing the Apollo server package and some specific um, classes and functions that we need out of that. We also have this other package called Apollo subgraph which is what's going to actually create that federated subgraph schema for us. Let's import the Mongo client. And then we're going to import our resolver code, um, which is just this other JS file here. We're going to also import our data sources. Now, as we said, we just writ wrote that and we all just renamed the file. So let's make sure that that is correct. And then we called it launch API. So after that, we'll pull in our environment from the .m file, and then we'll actually read our schema and save that as a constant object. 
within the server initialization file. Now, the reason we're doing this is because we actually want to get this schema and we want to be able to use it to initialize the Apollo subgraph in just a few lines. Now, what you'll note is that I'm actually, I have my schema as a separate file on disk. I don't have it like written within a source code file. It's kind of its own, you know, dot GraphQL document. And the reason I'm doing this is because it makes it very easy to interface with other kind of external tools, and especially the Apollo tool called Rover, which we'll sh show in just a second. Rover is the way that we're able to actually publish our schema to the Apollo registry. Um, it's also the way we can do things like schema checks, which allows us to an analyze our schema changes to help us look out for breaking changes or regressions, things like that. So then we're going to initialize our MongoDB client. Um, we're going to be pulling this in from the environment, our DB connection information. Um, this will actually um, be all loaded into our .in file. And we'll get to that um, in just a couple minutes. Um, we're going to, once we've loaded that MongoDB client and connected, we're going to actually access the correct database. And then from there, um, we will kind of go in and glue everything else together. Our database name for launches is actually Rockets Data. So go ahead and make sure that that maps up. Here's our data sources. And so if we had multiple data sources that we imported, so maybe we wanted to talk to multiple different backends or just organize things in a very specific way, we could have a bunch of these data sources defined and they'd all have you know, their kind of unique name that was identified when we initialize. So let's go ahead and initialize our launches data source, and we'll call that launch API, um, and we'll initialize it with this database object that we just constructed from the Mongo client. All right, so we're almost at the end here. The last thing we do is we create an Apollo server. This is kind of the way we did it also in the gateway. Um, but instead of using a gateway object, we're actually going to be passing in our schema. Uh, we're wrapping our schema in this function called build subgraph schema. Again, what this is going to do is it's going to take our schema that we've written and it's going to add in all the necessary Apollo Federation specification compliant bits so that Apollo understands that, yes, this is a federated schema. We'll also port pass in our data sources. This, once we do this, this will allow those data sources to be available within the query context from here on out so that we have access to those whenever we need to in order to execute our queries. Lastly, we'll just start the server and listen on a certain port. So pretty simple, um, not a ton going on here, but we just need to make sure that we're um, referencing the things we've written um, and um, have our, you know, database connections and database data um, names and stuff like that handy so that we can make sure it all works together. Okay, so we've got one more file that we want to take a look at to make sure that everything's set up correctly. And that's our resol resolvers file. The resolvers file is really kind of that link between the schema and the data sources. So it's the piece that's actually gluing that together. Um, and it kind of looks like when you're reading it, kind of like what our schema looks like. So if we go back to our schema, we can see here we've got query object, um, and then we've got um, these, um, all the different queries that we defined in here. It looks really similar to this resolver spot. Here's query, and then we need to actually replace this with our actual query names. So let's go ahead and do that. Our query name was git launches get launches here. And then the arguments that any of these GraphQL resolvers are pretty standard. Um, we get a parent object, we get arguments, we get a context object. Um, in this case, I'm just pulling out data sources uh, from that uh, context object. Then we have an info object. And all of this is available in the GraphQL documentation and the Apollo server documentation. So you can see exactly all the different stuff that's in each one of these. But um, kind of uh, one thing about the info object is it also has a reference to the schema in it. So if you needed to access that, um, you might want to pass that into whatever 
function that you're using to pull data from the database. So we know that we have our data sources here. Um, we don't actually need to access it through context. We can just access it like this, data sources. When we initialized our data sources in the server.js file, we called them launch API. And then in our actual our launches data source, we called our function get launches. Now let's go ahead and just check that to make sure that our arguments are correct. Do we actually have it? We just have the args passing in. Now we're not actually using it, but if we wanted to, we could extend this query to do things like have a filter um, or a sort or you know, specify a specific limit or any of that kinds of things. But for now, we're not actually doing that. It's, it's pretty simple. Launches and arcs. Okay. So if we've done everything right up until this point and haven't made any typos, we should be good to go and initialize our subgraph. And we should be able to actually start pulling data from our database. Now, first things first, we actually need to get our database connection string um, into our .m file so that we can talk to our database. Um, I've got that string right here, and I'm going to copy it in. And then I'll also talk about some of these other things, these environmental variables that we're going to need in the future. The Apollo graph ref um, is what we use to tell Apollo Studio and Apollo Registry what graph we're talking about whenever we're asking for a super graph. The graph ref um, actually has um, the graph name, and it also has what's called the variant name. Uh, and that's what the graph, graph is. Graph ID is actually kind of redundant here. It's actually just the graph name. Um, the subgraph name is what we're going to call this subgraph so that we can differentiate it from other subgraphs in our federated environment. We can go ahead and fill this in. Let's just, we'll call it launches. And finally, routing URL is going to be where the actual subgraph is accessible. So this will be you know, HTTP or HTTPS, you know, blah, which will be when I'm just developing it locally, it'll just be a local host. But when I actually deploy this out to public endpoint, it'll be whatever that um, domain name is. Okay, well, let's give this a shot. So I think we've got everything we need in order to start the subgraph up. And so First things first, though, we do need to install our NPM library. So let's go ahead and do that really quickly. This will install all the things that we need in order to make sure that this service runs. You know, for instance, the Apollo packages, um, our MongoDB client, all that kind of stuff. All right, we're good to go now. Let's give it a shot. So let's give it a port name. Um, we'll make sure that we give it a port name that's actually uh, unique from our other subgraph that's running, since we're just doing this in a shell. You could also very easily do this in Docker containers using Docker Compose. Um, but for this example, we'll just start up in a shell. OK, well, no glaring error so far, so that's a win. Um, <laughs> we've that's got a good start. Uh, yeah, we're, we're off on the right foot. Um, OK, so our service is available on localhost 4001, just like we did with the e-commerce store, we can actually load this up in our browser and utilize our sandbox to access it. So let's go ahead and put this in there. Open it up. Okay, so um, sandbox, since we just used it a few minutes ago, is remembering our last operation. Now, obviously, this subgraph doesn't know anything about rockets. It only knows things Yet. about launches. So we'll just get rid of this and we'll write ourselves a new query uh, that's actually going to be the get launch. Now, what's fun is that Sandbox is able to introspect our locally running server to get the schema of what that subgraph can actually do. So um, it knows that we actually have a get launches query already. So we can actually get rid of this and we can just write ourselves a new query. We can actually use the point and click interface here. So get launches, um, and we can get the ID date and the vehicle. And if our database connection is set up correctly, we'll be able to run this query. So let's check it out. All right, great. Uh, so everything's wired up correctly now. Uh, we have created a new subgraph. We created a new schema. 
We've wired it up to a MongoDB database. And now we can actually pull data using GraphQL from that database. So this is all fine and good. Now, the next step, though, was we want to create a federated architecture because this is where it gets very interesting because now we can actually start relating data to each other um, and we can do it in some very interesting ways. So before we get into that, we've already talked about this idea that the launches database, with the launches collection in the Rocket Data database has this field within it called vehicle. And what we know, because we looked at this beforehand, is that vehicle actually matches up to another collection that we have that is our rockets database. And the rocket name actually matches the vehicle here. So this is actually what we'll use to tie those two um, different services together whenever we want to do an API side join. Now, again, this doesn't have to be between MongoDB databases. That's kind of the beauty of federation is that one of these databases could be Mongo, one of these could be maybe a a graph database. Um, you can have another data source, which is just a third party API, and, but you can still have the ability using the Apollo Federation technology to actually relate data from all those different places and create these really, really powerful queries um, that allow the Apollo Gateway to reach out, pull together, join information, and give it back to you all at once. When you say a join, that doesn't really happen at the database level, right? Who does that for us? How do we define how data should be joined? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. Um, so the way that we define how data is joined is through the schema. And so the, here's our schema. And you know we've got one schema here, which is our launch schema. Let's actually pull up our other schema and then show those side by side so we can kind of see what's happening here. Okay, so we've got launch here, we've got rocket here. We've got customer, we've got cart, and we've got queries and mutations, all that kind of good stuff. Now, what we want to be able to do is we want to actually be able to query for our, our rockets. We want to be able to join in information about the launches that each one of those rockets has had. And so in order to do this, in order to affect this join, we need to somehow announce that there's a relationship between these two schemas. Now, the way that we do that with our current Federation technology, which is called Federation 2, is actually in a supernatural way. Because with Federation 2, we can basically declare that um, there is another type on the graph somewhere, and we can add fields to that type from a different service. So to illustrate that, let's actually do it right now. We've got over here our launch service, which is a completely separate microservice that just handles launches data. On the right-hand side, we've got our e-commerce microservice, which basically is our store. It's got the Rocket database. Um, it's got our cart, those kinds of things. Now, using the Federation technology, I can basically say that there exists a type Rocket on the graph. And I can do that by just saying type rocket. Now, in the previous generation of Federation technology, we actually used um, some extra keywords to help announce that um, you know, this was all happening. So we used something like the extend keyword, um, and that was utilized to say, hey, there's actually this type that exists somewhere, um, and that we're extending it. But here with Federation 2, we use a much more natural syntax. So we just say type rocket. Now, one of the things we do want to make sure we do is we want to make sure we expose um, the key field that we want to utilize in order to you know, relate this data together. And so I'm going to go ahead and do that. The key field that we're really interested in to relate this data together is actually the name field. And so I'm going to go ahead and, and put that in here, key. And let's go ahead and just put this, um, announce what type the name field is. Okay, so this is really our first step for utilizing Federation is just to say, is to let this subgraph know that there's a type called rocket. And that type has the field name. Now, what we wanna do next is we actually want to add a field to rocket. 
And that specifically, what we want to do is we want to add a field to rocket called launches so that whenever your front end application queries for rocket, it can also query for a field within that rocket called launches and it'll get a list of launches back. So this is kind of the, the really interesting part of Federation is your ability to do this cross service type extension. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm just going to say that there's a new field of launches and it's just going to return a list of launch objects. And so from a schema perspective, this is actually all we have to do. Now, whenever we actually publish each of these subgraphs to the Apollo registry, the Apollo registry has all the intelligence it needs to be able to merge these two subgraph schemas together. And it's going to create this super graph schema. The super graph schema is going to be that unified view into all of our data, all of our different queries and mutations and stuff across all of our different subgraphs. And whenever we see that unified representation of Rocket, we're going to notice that Rocket is going to have a new field attached to it, which is called launches. And it's going to be accessible just like if it was created that way initially at the subgraph level. And internally, the Federation API is going to do a couple of requests to both services and then join the data, right? Yeah, exactly. And we'll actually be able to visualize that in just a second, because the next step we're going to do after we've now created this schema and we've um, announced this new kind of type extension, or you could call it the sharing of a type, because now launches and the e-commerce subgraph kind of share the rocket type. Um, the launches subgraph is responsible for the dot launches attribute, and then the e-commerce subgraph is responsible for all the other attributes. Um, but in a federated architecture, you could actually have multiple different subgraphs, all sharing type or entity types. Um, and so they could all contribute to this in different ways based on the information we had. Um, you can think about the example of having a user type on your graph, and then you might have your reviews subgraph might contribute user.reviews to that type so that you could pull in all the reviews that a user's made. Your products subgraph might contribute user.products so that you have all the products they've purchased and on and on and on, right? All that information that's related to a user, you could contribute from those various different subgraphs. And then the gateway is going to know how to join that information together. The way that it knows is basically just what we did here. It knows it because we put it onto the schema um, using this syntax. But still, if something changes in the launch object, only the launch subgraph will know about that. We, we're only going to update that schema and not the subgraph, right? Yeah. Um, so that's a really good point to bring up. The One of the primary goals of Apollo Federation is to make it so teams can work independently. So one team is working on their particular subgraph. They might actually extend an object that is, you know, also, you know, that's lives somewhere else. But that other graph, so for instance, the e-commerce graph doesn't have to be updated whenever I make an update to the launches subgraph. I can push this update to the launches subgraph. Um, it'll automatically generate a new supergraph that'll automatically get synchronized to the gateway without the e-commerce team having to lift. So it allows your teams to be extremely autonomous. They get to work independently, push their updates to the super graph. And not only do they, do they get to work independently, but they also get to work in a safe manner because of the way that the Apollo registry works. We make sure that you're not going to push a change that breaks other people's pieces of the subgraph. And we also have a really powerful checks feature that allows you to analyze your changes even before you publish them so that you can identify any kind of problems that you might be introducing to the supergraph, and you can fix those really early in your development cycle. And those tools also integrate into your CI. So for instance, you might have it integrated into a feature branch pipeline where you push up your code for your feature branch, you run the Apollo tooling to analyze your changes and basically block that merge um, until you resolve those, those issues. Yeah, well, not breaking other people's code is it's good. Yeah, that's key. All right, so let's go ahead and push this subgraph up to the Apollo registry. 
All right, to do that, let's go ahead and close out our server. I've got a make file here, which has got some common commands in it that we can um, utilize to do some various different stuff with our subgraphs. So in here, two of the most common commands that you'll probably do with the Apollo CLI, which is called Rover, is to publish a subgraph change and also to then check those changes maybe as you're coding. So I've got some make file commands in here to make this a little bit simpler. I've got publish and I've got check. Whenever you run Apollo subgraph publish, what's going to happen is you're going to be pushing your local schema up to the Apollo registry. Now, in order to do that, the Rover command needs a couple of important pieces of information. One, it needs to know the graph reference. It needs to know, you know where your schema file is. It needs to know what you want to call your subgraph. And then it needs to know where to find that subgraph um, so that the gateway can actually make requests to it to pull in data. So I've got all this stuff importing from our .m file so that everything's in one place. What we'll do here is we will find out our Apollo graph ref. To do that, we'll jump into Apollo Studio. Um, and then we'll be pretty much ready to go and publish that subgraph up. So Apollo Studio, I've got right here. Apollo Studio allows you to manage a lot of different graphs within your organization and to be able to see a huge amount of information about how that graph's being used, to see reference so that your developers can kind of like all come to one place to read the documentation for the graph. It gives you insights into the observability um, information on the graph. Um, so you can look at performance and track errors. Um, it also has a section for looking at all the different schema checks you've run. So you can know um, what the latest kind of errors that have been caught by the schema check system have been. Um, a lot, a lot of information here. We don't have time to go into like a, a full overview of Studio today. We're just going to focus on what it looks like within the registry whenever you push up a new subgraph, and then we can look at what the query is going to look like from the gateway perspective. So I've already got our e-commerce subgraph pushed up into the Apollo registry. So we can see that here under the subgraphs heading. Here's our e-commerce um, subgraph. Um, you can see here that it's got, we've, we've got the information about where to look, find that e-commerce subgraph. Here's our rocket type, and our customer type, and our queries and things like that. So that's all here ready to go. Now, what I want to do is I actually want to push my launches schema up into the registry as well so that it'll create this new super graph for our rocket shop. It has all the stuff in it that we want. Can we look into the super graph now and then compare it? Yeah, sure. So, so the super here. graph now is actually going to be um, basically just the e-commerce subgraph, but with some interesting annotations on it, metadata. Now, one thing to note is that there's two things that the registry generates whenever you make a update to a subgraph. That's the API schema and the supergraph schema. The API schema is the more readable of the two because the API schema is, oops. So the API schema is the more readable of the two. The API schema basically is doesn't have any kind of metadata on it. So it's very clean. It just shows you the types and the queries in a unified fashion. The super graph schema actually has a lot of metadata baked onto it because the super graph schema has all of that service discovery information and that data ownership information. So if we clicked into it, we'd actually see a bunch of extra stuff in here. Uh, yeah, so for instance, you know, all this stuff is telling us which graph each one of these types lives on. Um, right now, this is very simple, but once you start sharing ownership of the you know, type, then it gets a little bit more metadata gets baked onto this to let the gateway or the router know where to reach out to find that information. I'm glad we don't have to write that ourselves. Yeah, this is really just for computers to look at. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's go ahead and push up our new subgraph. Now, the reason we came here in the first place is to get our graph ID. Um, to get that, we can just go to this readme tab. And so this is the graph ID, or the graph reference, rather. Um, the graph reference is made up of two pieces, the graph ID, which is rocket.shop, and then the, the actual variant that we want to push to. 
A variant is this concept where you can have multiple different kind of subtypes of a particular graph. Those generally map to things like environment. So you might have a dev variant, staging, or production, so that you can deploy your changes up into each one of those environments, check them out, make sure everything looks good before it goes to production. Um, variants actually have some other really cool uses as well, um, because we have this idea of a managed variant, um, and that's powered by something called contracts. Um, again, that's something we can't get into today, but variants are very useful in order for you to have uh, kind of different flavors of your graph for either testing um, or um, derived outputs. So let's go ahead and copy this, and we will put this back into our rover code, and we'll publish out this subgraph so we can get going. While you're doing that, rover is an actual npm package, right? It's not something that you wrote just for yourself. Right. Yes. This is actually the official Apollo CLI. It's called Rover. Um, most things within Apollo have some sort of space or NASA uh, naming attached to them. So, um, yeah, you can install Rover really easily. Uh, and we have documentation for a bunch of different ways to install it on the site. Okay. So, we wanted to make sure that our graph ref was correct. So, let's go ahead and put that in here. It's rocket shop at current. Let's go ahead and put in our routing URL. So when I launched the this subgraph server just a minute ago, I used localhost 4001. So I'm going to go ahead and make sure that that's in here. Okay. All right. So the last thing I need is actually an API key. Now I've already generated one of these, um, and there's two types of API keys within Apollo. One that's kind of a user API key, which follows your permission level. And then we have graph specific API keys. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use a graph specific one for this example. And we'll feed that into Rover and we'll launch this out. So let's go ahead and do that. And I will actually modify my make file to include the API. No, I can just put them in that in. Do it the right way. Don't, don't skip it. <laughs> so here's our Apollo key. And we'll make sure that the make file is close that. Okay, so We've got everything we need. We can go ahead and run this make file command. So what this is telling us is that there was a new subgraph that was created, um, and then that the gateway was updated because the push that we just did caused a new supergraph to be generated. And so if we go back into Apollo Studio, we'll note now that we have two subgraphs we can see the changes to the supergraph and how those are reflected. So let's go back into our schema. And then we can actually go into our registry, which is through this SDL tab. And actually, our new supergraph looks like it's still building. So it might just take us a minute to see the new subgraph pop up on the screen here. In order to see the status of that, we can actually go to this launches tab, and this will tell us what's happening here. Okay, it actually says that it was just completed um, that we launched this new subgraph onto the supergraph. So we can go back here, and then it should show up now. And here it is. So here's our launches subgraph, the one that we just pushed up. You can see here that it's got the launch type. It's also got our um, basically our type extension that we've created here. Now, let's go and look at the API schema now and see how that's changed. Because the API schema is kind of the clean version of the supergraph. And we can go in here and we can see, let's go down to our rocket type. OK, so here's our rocket type. And what you'll notice is that rocket now has a new field on it called launches. And so if we were to query for you know rocket.launches, we're going to get a list of launches for that specific rocket. It's going to be returned back to us. So we can actually visualize how the gateway is going to execute this particular operation through the Explorer. So we go into the Explorer, 
and we can actually write a sample query for our get rockets. So we'll get rockets, we'll get back the name, the ID, but we'll also get back launches. And so let's get back from launches like the year and the payload. Now we're actually gonna run this yet because we haven't written the last piece of code we need to actually make this run. But what we can do is we can look at what's called the query plan. The query plan shows us what the gateway is going to do in order to execute this particular operation. So what it's telling us is that at first it's going to fetch data from the e-commerce subgraph. And so that's going to be the get rockets query, and it's going to be the ID and the name fields that we're pulling out. It's going to get those from the e-commerce subgraph. Then it's going to ask launches subgraph. It's going to say, hey, launches, I actually need all of the data that's related to these specific rockets. And then it's going to launch is going to return that back. And then the gateway is going to merge that information together. And it's going to send it back to the front end client that asked for. And if we build a resolver for just a single rocket, uh, we can also use that launches field, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, that basically what happens is that it's not the Federation type extension doesn't actually interface directly with the query. It's direct. It's interfacing with the type. So as long as you're returning the same type, um, whether a list of that type or just a single instance of that type, um, you'll still be able to access that data and do that join. Perfect. So there, yeah, the schema is already described. Right, exactly. So let's go ahead and add in the code we need to make this work on our launches subgraph. Let's close this out. So in order to make this work, we need to add a new resolver. Now, typically, whenever you're writing any code that uses Apollo Federation, one of the concepts that you're going to get introduced to is this idea of a entity resolver um, using something called resolve reference. Resolve reference is basically a generic way for Apollo to be able to look up a particular um, type on the, the supergraph. So what it allows us to do is basically send basically an abstract representation of that type that just has the type name and then some sort of key field information. And then our entities resolver will return back that type for us. So it's kind of like a generic way to query for data um, on your various different subgraphs that support Apollo Federation. Now, in this particular case, we're going to be querying for um, a little bit more specific data, but you'll get this, the idea of what's happening. So in order to make all this work, to button up the last little bit of um, the resolver information, what we're going to do is we're going to add a new resolver here. Um, and the resolver is actually going to be for a, that field of rocket that we are providing on the subgraph. So the kind of more generic way to write a, um, a resolver for this particular entity is to use this resolve reference. Now we can actually write a very more, a more specific way of doing it. And that's what we'll do here to make it very simple and show exactly what we're doing. So as you know, we actually extended the type called rocket. So we're just gonna mirror this in our resolver here. So we have rocket and the field that we're adding to rocket is called launches. So all we have to do is write the resolver for this function and then our join is going to work. Now, more generically, we could write a resolve reference, which would basically be a way to resolve, you know, any, if we extended multiple different fields on this type, if we, you know, have kind of like some logic in there to decide which one we want to pull back. But in this case, we make it very simple. So let's go ahead and write this resolver. The way that we write this resolver is very similar to the way we write any other resolver. So we'll just have async, and we'll have here um, the actual parent object, which is the rockets. Uh, we won't use any arguments. We'll use our data sources. And so here we can basically just return back the 
data sources function that we're going to use to get this data. Um, we actually don't even need to. So here we'll just have launch API. And then we have to make a new function in that launch API to actually get this particular data back. So to be very you know, verbose, we'll probably call this thing exactly what it does. So maybe we call it something like get launches by, by vehicle. Um, and that's basically all we have to do here. Um, actually, what we want to do is this rocket object is going to be um, basically just the bare bones piece of the rocket object. And it's going to have in it the key that we need to look up our stuff. And so it's going to be rocket.name, which will be in here that we'll actually use to look up these launches. So this is whenever we have um, just a kind of a little background here. Whenever you've got a specific kind of um, entity type here, you've got a resolver for it. That first, um, and you've got like basically one of the fields of that type. So you're doing a field specific resolver here. That first argument is going to be the parent, which is going to be basically this rocket. But in our case, um, it's going to be rocket, but it's only going to be a very you know abstract representation of rocket. All right, so let's write this function and then we'll be ready to go to actually show how this all works. So to do that, we'll go into our data sources file. And we're going to write a function called it launches by vehicle name. And we're just passing in here the name of the vehicle. So now let's actually write this function. So this is going to be actually a query that we're going to be running against our MongoDB database. And so we'll use kind of our, our typical kind of like query you know, functions to do that. So to get us started, we can just copy this code from this other query that we have. And now, what we want to query for, though, is we only want to get the launches that are associated with a specific rocket type. And so we know the name of the rocket that's coming in here. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that this query is filtered by just getting the launches that are associated with that particular rocket name. So in our query thing here, we'll actually write that filter. Now we know, because we just talked about how these two data are related, that it's actually the vehicle field on the launches collection that is what we'll actually be able to query on. So to do that, we'll just put in here vehicle, and there is equals name. Um, we can keep our limit at 50 for now, if it seems like it's taking too much time to do all these queries, you know, we can obviously um, push that down. And then we're going to be executing our very typical kind of MongoDB find here, returning as array, remapping our IDs, and that is basically it. So this, what this is allowing us to do is we've said that we're going to offer this new field on Rocket. Now we've written the database function that's actually going to pull in the data for that field based on the key. Looks good. Let's see if it works. Let's see. All right. So in order to test this out, what we want to do is we actually want to run our entire super graph. And so in order to run our entire super graph, we're going to run our gateway, we're going to run the e-commerce subgraph, and we're going to run our launches subgraph. And we're going to do it all at the same time. Now again, if you're kind of doing this you might want to do it using something like Docker Compose. But in our particular case, now I'm just going to use a couple of different terminal windows and we'll get everything launched up. So let's first go into our e-commerce. Let's get this running at port 4000. Um, and then let's go and start up our gateway. Run this. 8,000, that's what we chose for this one. Oh, we have actually not installed any of our um, libraries for our gateway. So let's go ahead and do that really quick. Okay, we 
rerun that. We probably haven't got our API key in there yet. Let's double check. Nope, we don't have it in there. So let's go ahead and copy in that API key and that graph reference. This is super important because the gateway needs to be able to reach out to the registry and pull in the super graph. And if it doesn't know your API key and it doesn't know which graph you're interested in, then it's not going to be able to do that very easily. So. So now we've got the information that the gateway needs in order to initialize, talk to Apollo Studio, pull down the correct super graph from the registry. Okay. The gateway is ready to go. So last but not least, let's launch our launches service and see if we have a full federated subgraph that's doing API site jumps. Do we need to redeploy that since we wrote one resolver function for it? Well, we're actually just running the code locally, so we don't need to redeploy that. If we had changed the subgraph specification, then we would have need to republish that subgraph to Apollo Studio in the registry. But since we're just running all this locally, we shouldn't have to redeploy it. Okay, so we've got all of these different running all these different services running now. Now, since we actually have all these running, and since we've got our subgraphs deployed into the Apollo registry, we don't have to use the sandbox anymore. We can go back to that rocket shop project and actually use the full studio to query this because studio is going to talk to this locally running gateway in order to pull back its data. So we can go into studio. Here is our studio. Here's our rocket shop. Um, we've got our schema here. All of our different subgraphs are deployed here. We've got Explorer. Explorer is configured because we did this beforehand to actually talk to localhost 8000, which is the address of our, our gateway that's running. And so it's all ready to go. And then we have full access to all of our different queries that we've written here. Now, the query that we're most interested in is this Git Rockets query that we were talking about. We ran the, we, or we looked at the query plan just a second ago, but now we want to actually see if we can pull that data together utilizing the Apollo Supergraph. So let's go ahead and see if this works. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. Okay. So here's our result set that's come back. So what's happening is that, like we said earlier, we are calling the Git Rockets query, which is owned by the e-commerce subgraph. Um, we're pulling back the ID and name of those rockets from that subgraph. And then what we're doing is we're utilizing the launches subgraph to pull back the year and payload for each one of those different rockets. So if we scroll down here, we, we can see here that for each one of these rockets, we've got all the launches being pulled back. Well, at least 50 of them. If there's more than 50, we're not doing it. All of those. Can and fetch so, the vehicle key from launches so that we can see yeah, sure. if it matches the name. Okay, so here's the name and here's the vehicle. Now I trust you. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> the right launches. Yeah, it's not just random data coming back. Okay, so in this example today, what we've done is we've written our own custom subgraph that's talking to a MongoDB database. And then we've related data between our e-commerce subgraph and our launches data so that your front-end application with just a single query can pull back information about the rockets, but also have the related launch information in that same payload. Thank you so much for this walkthrough, JC. I couldn't help but gather a few questions and I just waited until now to ask them. So we discussed that every subgraph can be one team's responsibility and teams can be independent in that way. So we had one subgraph for the e-commerce database. Does it make sense splitting this subgraph into um, more subgraphs, like one subgraph for a cart, one subgraph for uh, the rockets or the products, one subgraph for the login service uh, so that every 
team is responsible for one of these subgraphs? Yeah, it could. Um, it really depends a little bit on the complexity of that you know, domain that you're working in there, the business domain. It makes sense, I think, from just a, at, at first blush, that maybe CART could be its own and that you have a team that was focused on kind of CART activities and maybe integrating with your payment processor or whatever. And then you'd have another team that was maybe more focused on keeping the Rockets database up to date, up to date you know. And so you really have the autonomy. It really depends on um, the team size, how much code is involved there, and those kinds of things that will dictate when you start breaking up a larger subgraph into smaller subgraphs. Typically, you probably don't need to do it until it becomes an issue. But um, because, you know, one of the things that we always struggle with within writing software is premature optimization, right? We like, oh, we can break this up into, you know, a dozen subgraphs and then everything's very discreetly packaged and very nice, but then it becomes a huge headache because you have all these different repositories that you have to update. And so you really want to wait and not over optimize at the very beginning. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. I know that we have common clients that are using Apollo and also MongoDB Atlas. Uh, how many subgraphs do they have in your experience? We don't need to name a particular customer, but just does, do we talk about a dozen of subgraphs or maybe two or three subgraphs? Yeah, so typically our customers are utilizing Federation in order to be able to pull together data from a lot of different data sources. So that might be you know, a couple of different MongoDB clusters, but it also might be, let's say, their ERP system or some other kind of like back end payment processing. Maybe they're using Salesforce for their commerce cloud or whatever. They want that to be a sales or a subgraph. And then they can relate that data together with the MongoDB data. Maybe they've got data also stored, let's say, in a headless CMS or something like that. They want to relate that with MongoDB data with their Salesforce Commerce Cloud data. And they can do that with the Apollo Federation technology on Supergraph really easily. So I'd say that, you know, um, customers of our one that I can think of, it's a really big MongoDB customer. Um, they've got like four different clusters uh, that they've got integrated in various different ways into um, Apollo Supergraphs. But then they've got other databases that they're also pulling in. So the number of subgraphs is actually a lot larger. Yeah. And we can see that it scales well, even with different types of subgraphs. And I also know that in Atlas App Services, uh, we, you can create a GraphQL API for your existing data. So basically using your Atlas database as a data source and expose that as a GraphQL API. And this already follows the GraphQL specification. So there wouldn't be any problem integrating that as a subgraph as well, right? Yeah, that's right. Since the Atlas Services endpoint is GraphQL specification compliant, you can put that into a federated environment. Um, the only things you can't do right at the moment are some of the type extension bits, um, but maybe in the future. So one thing that is really easy using the document model and MongoDB is um, schema migrations or schema migrations in the sense of the document schema that you have when uh, using a document database. How does that how does that match up to the GraphQL schema that you have to write for your API? Yeah, that's a great question. So one thing to think about is that the GraphQL schema is kind of an abstraction layer in the sense that it doesn't really need to map one to one to the underlying data model. And many times it won't because the underlying data model is at times designed to be a great model for specific things in terms of how you're storing data, how you're migrating data, all that kind of stuff. And so just keep in mind that the schema doesn't have to match up. But at the same time, the flexibility of the MongoDB data model actually is very compatible with the way that the GraphQL schema works. So for instance, very easy for you to add a new field to a MongoDB document. Let's say that you um, decide that you're going to start tracking um, the date that someone joined a service. So you just start adding that new field to the new documents that you're adding to your collection. Well, those kinds of migrations uh, are very easy in MongoDB, and they're actually also very easy with GraphQL. 
because adding new fields to types within GraphQL is actually super simple. You just add that new field. And you don't actually have to worry too much when you're doing those type of operations because adding a new field to a type is generally going to be backwards compatible just because of the way that um, GraphQL operations work. They are based on you know, selection sets of fields within these types. And so adding new things is you know, generally very easy to do. One thing that makes that even easier is the Apollo Rover tool actually can utilize our schema check technology. So whenever you're adding new fields or even taking away fields from your schema, you can simply run Rover subgraph check, analyze that change you're about to make and make sure that it's not going to cause any regressions with your existing API clients. And that's super important because you want to make sure that before you remove anything or alter something that's in place, that it's not currently been in use or hasn't been in use for a certain time frame that you want to specify. And so because of that, working with the Apollo Supergraph and our schema technology makes it really easy to keep your data models up to, up to date and make sure that you're not making any changes that you're going to regret. That's real. That sounds pretty good. And finally, how do I integrate this Supergraph that you just built into my own web application that we saw in the beginning? Yeah, so it's actually going to be just a new endpoint. Um, all of the queries that you've been utilizing before for like, let's say your original graph or your original subgraph are going to work with the supergraph. The supergraph is basically just going to add that routing layer on top of your existing GraphQL applications. But you also get a lot of other really cool things for free by adding that super layer. One of the things is you get the Apollo Studio observability tooling. So you'll have really deep insights into exactly how all of your different GraphQL operations are executing down to the resolver level. You also get client segmentation so you can see which clients are using which fields and which queries. So you have a really advanced capability to understand your graph usage but also protect your graph from changes that might cause regressions or some sort of graph composition error. Pretty cool. Well, let's try it out. All right. So this is the application that they currently have. We saw it in the beginning. And for this demo, I just want to be able to get the launches and display uh, the launches in the product page. So I'm going to switch to my source. All right, so the only thing I need to do here is actually change my GraphQL URI. Currently, I'm using the Atos App Services uh, for my kind of uh, GraphQL endpoint, and I have some authorization set up. I can ignore all that since we haven't built the authorization uh, and just change the, uh, the endpoint. As you can see, we have uh, an environment variable, but for the simplicity, this demo, I'm going to just put in the, uh, the array that I have. And that's it. I'm using the Angular Paul client. Um, and let's save the file and see if the app works. Of course, I have to start it first. I'm still able to fetch data from our federated API. And if I navigate to a rocket, we can see that uh, we still have the details page working as well. What I want to do is actually use our uh, super graph and our endpoint to fetch the launches from this other launches database. To do that, I'm going to head over to the rocket details component and modify the request that I'm sending to add the launches field. And for launches, I'm going to grab the uh, vehicle name and site. That's all I need for now. And let's test out if this is actually working. I'm just going to lock the result I'm getting from the API. Let's try this rocket. And as you can see here, we have the launches. They're all from the same site. I guess it wasn't a very successful rocket if they had to try launching it multiple times. But the important part is that we can actually use this data and display it in the product page.
I'm getting an error from the Angular language service uh, because this launches field doesn't exist in our uh, client side type over here. So I'm just going to add it. And for simplicity, I'm just going to cast it to any. All right, let's see if that works. I actually want to display just the launch site. Yeah, we can see the launch site over here. And of course we can fetch all the data we need and display it in a more uh, sophisticated way. But after all, we were able to achieve what we wanted. We uh, sent just a single API request and the Apollo router does all the uh, joins and all the matching of data for us. Well, thanks Danimir for having me on today. If any of you want to play around with Apollo Studio, you can go and sign up for a free account. All the code that we used in today's coding exercise will be made available, and you'll be able to click and download it in order to set up your own SuperGraph. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe to the MongoDB channel for more developer content.